What's up and welcome to the Level Health Podcast. Today, Josh is interviewing Gabriel Lafontaine. Gabriel is a personal trainer, precision nutrition level one coach, and the founder of Bien Nourri. Big thanks to Gabriel for coming on our show. Be sure to check out bien nourrica or his Instagram. We'll have both of those linked in the description below. Thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Um, so it's great to talk to you today, Gabriel, because we're going to be discussing something that um, I've been thinking about for a long time. I think that you inevitably end up thinking about it if you're in the lifting game and the fitness space for long enough. You go through these kind of transformative experiences, I think, or you end up what I've seen many, many men, especially I mean, people my age, you hit a certain point in which you are not able to continue going with the approach that you, you know, you used in the past and you end up banging your head against the wall. And a lot of time that comes down to our own beliefs, our own ideologies and things like that. And I think it's especially painful. I've seen, I mean, coming from my experiences um, with men going through this, it, and it, and it becomes like this big ego experience for um, people. And so it's good to talk to you about it today. I'm very excited to kind of flesh things out a little bit. I didn't prepare at all for this, by the way, because I've, like I said, we've, I've, I've been immersed in this space for so long. I wanted to see where this conversation just kind of naturally went. Absolutely. Sounds great. And uh, happy to be here. Happy to uh, touch on this topic because I think it's something that's not discussed enough, right? Uh, especially for, for men up there, it's always either, well, here's what the science says, uh, yep. here's what you should be doing and never like, oh, here's what I think, how, here's how I feel about this, uh, this whole fitness thing. Yeah. I mean, so before we get into like too much of the nitty gritty, um, if you don't mind starting out, Gabriel, just a little bit of background on who you are and why you do what you do, but then just kind of uh, paint a picture for this issue, because I feel like if I introduce it, it's going to come off a little bit um, standoffish, a little bit like a little bit uh, bitter, because it was my personal experience. You know, these pitfalls are ones that I tripped on myself on a daily basis for the better part of the decade. So if you don't mind just kind of introducing yourself and then introducing, introducing the problem a little bit for us. Yeah, for sure. So I think just like most of us in this field, right? Um, I've had a atypical uh, background and uh, way into this into this profession. Um, so I've always been a, um, a soft science guy, humanities and all since uh, since college and all. And all. Um, having done a lot of my um, my education in um, in actually um, what we call uh, extremism and violent extremism here in, in Canada. So terrorism studies, um, yeah, national security and all that stuff. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So that's my personal background, my, my, my education. And people usually don't um, see, see the link. But uh, what's interesting is that in this field, there's there's um, two main approaches, right? One of the, the hard security approach, which is intelligence security and the other one is more of the prevention side of it and um, one more from the prevention side of it which is the one I come from we take a um, a public health approach right so preventing um, and touching on the uh, social determinants of health uh, to prevent people from escalating to violent extremism radicalization and, and just violence in general and once you start seeing the the, this picture behind the issue, you start to see how much uh, public health just touches all issues of, of, of well-being and, and human health in general, right? So whether we're talking about uh, the issues related to obesity, um, access to healthcare, or in this case, um, violent extremism, they just tend to be what we call the social determinants of health. Um, so that's was my first uh, my first introduction into uh, issues related to health. And um, that was more from a, a uh, academic background. Then I had my own personal journey, which uh, which is why I ended up in, in this, this field. Um, I'm someone who's had a lot of health issues in, in the past growing up and just not being able to access uh, proper treatment and, and counseling uh, to address my physical and mental health, growing up with um, being in an overweight body, dealing with uh, obesity uh, for most of my, my youth and my um, my young adulthood and um, people usually have a perspective of, of what it means of, of, of growing up with uh, weight issues but uh, just to be uh, to be honest uh, it's just not something you can understand until you go through it um, the the experience you, you'll have uh, when you're exposed to 
uh, living in a different body, whether it comes from being a, an overweight obese body or being in a, a neurodivergent body or uh, suffering from any kind of a handicap, it just means that your daily experiences are are, are sculpted through through this. The way people perceive yeah. you and um, just the way they they'll uh, come up to you and, and their first interaction usually is is pre-drafted before you get a chance to define who you are in social interactions. So that was something that really, really impacted my 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 youth and, and my coming up. And until I was probably around 2021, 20, I was uh, dealing with issues related to, to obesity. Um, and I had mostly decided that that's just the way I was going to be. Uh, because being honest, losing weight is, is as you guys probably know, not the easiest thing in the world. Um, so I was at a cross path where I actually decided um, I would sign up for um, um, to, to, to get bariatric surgery. Um, and I reached out to a, a team of healthcare professionals. Um, but I decided I would give myself one last shot going forward with just lifestyle changes. And, um, and see, sometimes it's just about being the right time in the right place and just having the right support. And I ended up being able to lose some weight and sustain a uh, over 100 pound weight loss for now uh, over five or six years. Um, and that's how I, I, I got into the, the nutrition part of it. And, and we'll come back to this, but um, one of the big things you get to learn when, when you go through something like this is it's impossible to maintain a weight loss and beat the, the, the odds and the statistics and, unless this becomes a major part of your daily life and your reality. So that's how I, I've, I've come to, to work in this field and, and just combining my, my interest for public health. And um, just for nutrition, uh, from having to learn this to, to manage my, my own well-being in my, uh, my, my daily life. Yeah, there's a lot that we're going to come back to there because uh, I, I, like multiple points there that we could go down. But I think that it's important to point out that your background in the soft sciences, like you said, I think there, even though we are in a hard science new to some degree, nutrition, biochemistry, you know, all that kind of stuff, the physiology behind it would be considered a hard science. I think that you coming from a soft science allows you to see some of these perspectives that other people aren't gonna see. I'm reading a book called um, Originals actually by Adam Grant. And it's just how a lot of times we think that, you know, kind of original you know, like change makers are out there and they've been working very, 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 very hard in this one specific area until they have an enlightening experience. When in reality, sometimes, or even often, they come from the outside and they are looking at things with a fresh perspective. So it's not surprising that you're kind of, we're able to eventually buck the, the trend and, and especially in this specific part of this hard science, I think that talking about the interplay between psychology and our, how our ego reflects in how we train and, and, and the factors that we put in. And I remember I used to flex on people with how many supplements that I had, those kinds of things like understanding the, the psychology and the soft science behind that, I think is very important. Um, and, and to understanding the entire scope of everything. But I like you having that background for sure, I think was pretty crucial. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's something we're realizing more and more, especially in nutrition and just prevention in general is that most of the, the hard questions we've figured out at least yeah. uh, the basis of it right now, it's like, how do we implement these changes? How do we um, make the behavior stick? And, and that's where we'll just have to we'll keep working on, on uh, qualitative issues and uh, soft sciences. Yeah, I think so I was thinking, um, you mentioned that you had lost weight and maintained it. And, and right away, my initial um, response or thought is to congratulate you. However, over time, I've realized that's really an inappropriate response to that, because it's really not something um, that you can uh, kind of inject yourself in somebody's life in such a personal way. And like, you don't realize it, but you have effects on people good or bad with the way and and people in going through the transformation is so incredible i mean really everybody is so honestly a little bit susceptible to influence like i said good or bad um but you know kind of stepping back away from the the weight loss thing um what are some of the i want to say not breakthroughs but what are some of the breakthroughs that you had specifically in terms of like how you were able to make this transformation i, I know that you said that um you tried a couple times nothing worked um, what were some of the the kind of best practices that you put into place? 
for best practices, this is a really interesting question because we have some data on this from, from some of the, the, the studies, um, not many, but for example, the, the behaviors from the um, National Weight Loss Registry mm -hmm. in the US, which is the, the only uh, database we have on people who have lost a significant amount of weight and have maintained it for a long period of time. Uh, but that is, interestingly, that's, well, of course, it's very uh, biased because we, it's self-selected for people who succeeded, right? So survivorship bias. Yeah. Um, and it's something that, that only looks at uh, physical weight loss and not the, the impacts on well-being. So uh, we can't infer the, the health benefits of these behaviors other than to say that people who lost weight are having these behaviors. So um, we know that people who weigh them uh, weigh themselves on a daily basis tend to be um, uh, more likely to maintain weight loss. People who uh, express ability to uh, to uh, use flexible restraint, flexible control, um, tend to maintain weight loss. People who are aware of their hunger signals, people who score high, more uh, higher on on the IES scale, so intuitive eating scale. Uh, to uh, are more likely to maintain weight loss. So we, we, we can kind of draft a, a landscape of behaviors that are supportive of, of, of maintaining weight loss. But then uh, going back to your question, it's, it's easy to look at the science and be like, well, you know, this is what we should be doing. And then actually living it day to day is a very, very different uh, question, yeah. right? Um, and sometimes just being a cognizant of the science is, is even harder because then you have to choose whether or not you follow what we could consider a theoretical best practice versus what is your um, in-person uh, <laughs> experience with it, right? So um, uh, weighing uh, yourself, right? We know that's a very complicated question because it can be both a be, uh, positive or negative um, uh, factor into your well-being and maintenance, right? So uh, there's been periods where I, I, I weigh myself daily. I, I still do currently. There's been periods where I, I don't weigh myself for months on end because it just increased my 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 anxiety levels um, and and my uh, my my focus on on food appearance and well-being. Um, so. I think the best thing to do is just knowing what are the, are, are the tools that may be supportive of, of maintaining the weight loss and then just adapting the strategies as you go uh, day to day. But some of the things that I, I've used or I'm using, um, being aware that, um, I, I, we'll call it a diet, right? The diet that, that leads, a diet and lifestyle that leads to, to weight loss means that um, you'll be dieting for the rest of your life. Right. That's something that people usually don't want to know, understand, or people don't talk about it. People can't understand this until they, they've, they've gone through it, right? Um, as much as there's contention on the, the issues related to um, settling point, set point, or dual intervention, set point, um, looking at the papers like from, from John Speakman and stuff like that on these issues, uh, we know that at least there are some physiological mechanisms that uh, want to push your body to, to regain the weight. So uh, once you, you lose a significant amount of weight, we know that even after um, there's been a significant period of, of weight min maintenance, your body doesn't adapt 100% to the new uh, settling point. So that means that once you're, you're at your new maintenance calories, uh, which is lower than it would be if you hadn't lost weight, well, you'll be dealing with some hunger issues even if you're at maintenance, right? You'll be dealing with some increased food focus. You've, you'll be dealing with um, a higher, um, uh, higher palatability from foods, uh, a higher driver to, to eat a second portion of stuff like that. So it's something that you have to be aware of and you'll, you're, you have to be ready to, to take on for the rest of your life if it's something you want to do. Yeah, all of those. I mean, you mentioned the idea that those are all tools that are supportive of weight loss and weight loss maintenance. I think that that's, that's crucial um, to consider that and also, like you said, kind of being aware of all the tools. And that's really, I think, where the, the fitness professional and nutrition professional should be that liaison between them and they understand the tools and how to use them, but most importantly, when to use them and with who. Uh, and that's very, that's definitely hard. I mean, as a fitness consumer or just, you know, somebody wanting to make any type of, you know, fitness related transformation in their life, health related transformation, whether that's weight loss, building muscle, gaining strength, maintaining those as you age, all of those things are hard. 
I wanted to ask you, what are some ways that men specifically and our weird cultural um, um, moral m mores, I believe would be the word, but just our ideals around fitness, that masculine alpha male mentality, how are some of those ways that we make something that's already hard, weight loss, building muscle, you know, maintaining those as we age, how do we make it harder? Yeah, um, you were talking about books you were reading. I've been reading a book recently that's been really, really interesting. And uh, something I, I, I haven't been wanting to explore is, is the issue of the, 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 it's called the male code, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The male code and breaking the male code is actually a type of book. And it's pointing to the issues of, of friendship in, in men. Um, and this is one of the crucial issues at, that is different between men and, and, and women uh, for, for weight loss and for, for well-being is that men, especially nowadays, tend to be not as apt as women at maintaining uh, friendships as they age. We know that having social support, uh, and not just friends, but meaningful friendships, so you can get the support you need when you need to, uh, by not having supportive friendships and a supportive environment, um, you're creating a, a less favor favorable environment for you to lose and maintain your, your weight loss in the future. Um, so that's one part of it. And then the other part of it that's related to it is just not being able to talk about the way you feel and just not wanting to admit that, well, there's stuff going inside of you. Um, that's not physiological, right? Some, some, some emotions, some, some thoughts, uh, some behaviors uh, that are not just rational, right? So stuff that that's uh, usually we'll refute as, as, as wanting to be a, an alpha male just want to be yeah. a, a dominant right just not wanting to admit that well you know what maybe um i am dealing with some issues that may not be an eating disorder but may be on the scale of disordered eating uh, and just recognizing that can make the difference between talking to someone or a professional or family member and just ignoring that and then letting that compound for a long time I want to stop there for a second, because that's absolutely an experience that I had personally. I mean, I looking at it from just like an efficacy, efficacy perspective, my approach. And in, in fact, that's kind of the the kind of the, what irks me the most about this kind of mentality that we really do see rampant in the fitness space. It's not that, you know, any one um, mindset or anything is more um, appropriate for this you know, our, our society or anything like that. It's the inefficacy of the approach. And that, and, that, and, and that's only becomes more apparent over time when you see, I mean, I always know the objections that I'm going to have when I have a middle-aged man um, but, uh, onboarding as a new client. I already know I'm going to have to tell him to, to, you know, back off the weight a little bit. You know, don't be so worried about going as intense as possible. Like we don't need to be at a 10 out of 10 every single time. And in, like I've said at the beginning, those kinds of things may work as we're, as we're younger, but eventually there's a transformation that needs to occur. And that happens on many levels. That happens on like the reasons why we're lifting. I think for most people, it starts off very um, selfish and externally motivated. And then over time, um, you know, this just it might be the opposite of survivorship bias. The people that continue over years and years and years in, in their entire lifetime has traditionally been people that found a little bit more um, deeper value in it. Um, so kind of back to, you know, talking about like the mail code and stuff, what are some, I, I've often thought that it's almost, it would be interesting if we got like Jane Goodall to go and observe um, people in a gym, because the, the, the strange behavior, the peacocking, the posturing, all of that stuff um, ends up, again, reducing the efficacy of people's training programs. And that's kind of really when it, like I've said, I've had difficulty communicating this and explaining this. Um, how can we try to communicate that to people how can we try to communicate hey you know we see your approach this isn't my you know this isn't my opinion but your approach is incongruent with what the results that you want to and honestly or more often than not it, it comes from wanting to you know appear stronger than other people to appear you know more alpha than other people they'll do exercises that allow them to lift more weight so that they can see more weight on the bar but in reality if they were to take a step back and remove themselves, you know, it's not necessarily what's going to get them the results they seek. So how can we start to try to communicate that in some way? Yeah. And I think the approach can be different depending on if someone that's, that's new to the, to the fitness versus someone who's been around for a while. Right. So if someone who's new to fitness, fitness, we're hoping that they're open-minded and if they're working with you as a coach, well, they trust you and that's your job as a coach to build that relationship. So they, when, when, you know, you ask a question, they answer it honestly. And 
well, they, they at least <laughs> are interested in what we have to, to, to tell them or suggest, right? If it's someone who has already their own ways and that's more grounded to their, their own approach, um, it's, it's, it's a question that, that uh, the guys that um, Precision Nutrition always recommend asking is, well, how is that working for you? <laughs> You've been lifting for six years or eight years now, maintaining between 13 and 19% body fat because every time you end a cut, you rebound five pounds and then slowly creep up another eight pounds within two and a half months. Okay, uh, maybe that's uh, not working so good. What about like your training? Well, um, you've changed programs four times in the last five months. Uh, you never finish uh, a training cycle. Um, you refuse to deload because you think it's boring or, or whatever approach it is, deloading or not, that's a different question, but whatever. Um, and then you try to not follow the, your program because you want to progress faster. And then you just add an extra uh, 20 pounds on the bar this week because you just felt like, you know what, music's good and I can do it, no issues. <laughs> and even if your back is hurting, uh, well, every time you do that, you pop something in your back and then you can't lift or you can't deadlift for, for two and a half months. So how's that working for you? Yeah, that's a, a kind of an element I would think of, not directly, but it reminds me of like a, a motivational inter interviewing, the, the similar tactics. In fact, that probably is directly from, but just letting them make those decisions or make those um, realizations themselves. Of course, it's never, the, the approach that never works, and I learned this from doing it multiple times, is to just outright tell them what's wrong with their approach. Because oftentimes, you know, someone will come up to you, whether it's a friend or just an you know, acquaintance, especially working as a trainer at a gym, and they'll ask you some, you know, stuff about their program and their approach, or almost kind of in like, they don't really want to know, they're just telling you in hopes that you confirm it for them so they can continue. But so, you know, doing those where it's more of a teasing out that response and trying to help them make that discovery on their own, I have found that that's somewhat more effective. But again, it comes back to there are a lot of forces in the industry. And I'd like to my next question for you is where do these come from? Where do these stem, you know, in our past? But um, there are a lot of forces in the industry, whether that's social media, with any YouTube, any, any of these. I mean, we saw it at, at, you know, when I was coming up from just coming from muscle mags, you know, we have you know, Kai Green or we got you know, Jay Cutler promoting this new supplement or training program. I'm going to assume that they know what they're doing because they are more alpha. They are more, you know, they have a higher status than me. But in reality, that's really chasing, pushing you in the opposite direction. Um, but back to kind of like, what are the roots of this? Is this kind of mindset? Has this just been inherent in the fitness space? Is it just something that came with you know, the, the need for men to kind of compete against one another, or is there something else that we can kind of trace this back to? I think this, this, a lot of this point points back to some of the stuff we, we touched on during the, the panel the conference, right? It's, um, the, the social construct image of, of a male of, of the gender and what goes with it, right? Um, so guys are expected to do X, Y, and Z, uh, you're expected to provide for your family, provide to Right. I mean, just look at it, pull, pull any magazine up, pull any movie. Um, I don't know if you saw like the most recent Top Gun movie, right? Um, no, man, I avoid, if, <laughs> I avoid if, it on purpose. Yeah. If you want to see like a purebred American movie that's like pulled from a magazine, right? Like this is what it is, right? It's the guys doing push ups and yeah. flying big, <laughs> big jets and just being manly men. And that's just the idea of, well, that's what American heroes do. Yeah. So, so a lot of, of the idea of, of behaviors as men just come from social construction of, of what men or successful men do in, in our society. Um, and then where, where we want to go with this question kind of depends, right? Is it, is it successful? Well, that's an interesting question. Why is this so pervasive? Um, well, that's an interesting question. And then um, one of the things that I think is, is starting to, to emerge more and more is, is we have an issue with masculinity in society, right? Um, and we just look at a guy like, like Jordan Peterson, which is someone who is very, very uh, divisive and who's going to be very, very adored in certain fringes of society and very rejected and hated on in other fringes in society. Uh, but e even a guy like him, right, there's a reason why he is successful and why he is popular in, 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 in these media. Uh, because whether or not what he recommends is, is, is smart or evidence-based, that's not the question, right? He is speaking truth or certain uh, fringe of the population, which is feeling unheard 
and, and not feeling like they're being represented and hurt in, in society. So having a, a, a hero or, or some maybe more fringe messaging that is not aligned with the what we would, would call like more the progressive left, well, it's just, it resonates with, with the same fringe of the population, which is, is feeling uh, unheard and, and feeling, well, they want to be the, the alpha male, uh, as we were touching on earlier, right? Yeah, there, there's a lot of, for, you, you just mentioned Jordan Peterson, but I'm thinking specifically in like in the new, in the fitness space, um, what are some of the forces that are, my thought is that it's likely, I mean, of course, there's social media, and then there's the influencers that are on there. And it, we're in this interesting time where people are now aspiring to be influencers. And those are the people that are role models. But also, I think that still um, the supplement industry is, is huge in this, of course, because you're, there's always people coming up into the fitness space, and they're all getting catching on to that treadmill of you got to buy every single supplement, everything like that. And the marketing that goes into that. I mean, I, even to the point where people that have like 500 followers have a supplement code and they're, they're promoting supplements. So it's like at that aspect seems kind of inseparable as well. What are some of the other forces you mentioned, obviously just popular culture and society. I mean, video uh, uh, movies have for the longest time, you know, popularized that, you know, the jacked male persona and, and that provides you status and attention and affection and all that stuff. But what are some of the other forces? Is it just kind of like part and parcel with our society and this kind of, um, you know, this um, intersection between the fitness space? Well, I think it really is, right? We just have to be um, cognizant of the fact that these ideas are, are just ideas, right? They, they're, they don't, they're not grounded in anything. We can have a discussion on whether or not like a higher testosterone in men makes them more competitive and stuff like that. Sure. Um, but if that was the really the driving force, well, first we'd see a historical consistency in, in these behaviors and, and, and themes. And we would also see a homogeneity through cultures and around the world, which is not the case, right? Yeah. If, if it was testosterone that was the main driver, we would never see societies that are mainly run by women in history, which we do have examples of, right? We would always see that the men always play the same role in society, which, which we don't. We would never see uh, gender fluidity or we would never see people having uh, different identities related really to the gender, sex, and, 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 and similar issues, right? Because if it was just a hormonal issue, well, it would have been that way since it's the era of time and it wouldn't have changed. And I know some people might say, well, this is the, guy, this is the way guys have been since, since cavemen and it hasn't changed, but we have very, very strong uh, research that proves that there is a very complex uh, narrative around on gender and identity that has evolved through the last, whatever 10,000 or 100,000 years you want, you want to point out, we've seen right differences in, in the societies and the representation of the, the male and the female and the men and the woman um, roles and responsibilities and identities. Yeah, I'm glad that you didn't say something like crazy, like the earth is only 6,000 years old. I would have had to turn this podcast because I've had people <laughs> argue that to me and not on a podcast, but in real life. But <laughs> this, I mean, so um it, this behavior is, you said, um, you know, we would have seen it historically consistent, but I think this is some of the most inconsistent and illogical behavior that I see really, I mean, okay, so we, we live in a very pri privileged society to where, I mean, we have to inject adversity in, into our lives by, you know, man, we could go down the road of the whole hustle mindset and the whole work harder, nobody cares kind of mindset, which again is incongruent, usually incongruent with the results that they say that they want. But again, it comes back to then survivorship bias. And I think that men are, uh, I don't know. And so I was actually, I wrote this down here because I wanted to bring it up at some point. And um, how do we kind of uh, rectify this concept with the kind of convergence between male and female behavior? Because I'm seeing, I'm seeing reels and TikToks of uh, women taking off their pump covers, which was uniquely male behavior for the longest time. So there, and I mean, all the way down to, you know, women are lifting heavier weights now and gosh, what an identity crisis that must be for some men that, including myself, I've trained women that are significantly stronger than me, significantly stronger than me. And that's something that I think you cannot do to some extent. I think that you have to kind of separate yourself from that ego because at a certain point, there's going to be somebody stronger than you. And now it can continuously become, or it's constantly becoming more likely that there's a, a woman, female in the gym that are stronger than you. So uh, this convergence that we're seeing, um, what do you think is going to be happening over the next coming decades, specifically in the fitness space? Of course, we can't uh, forecast the entire society, but. 
yeah and i think that's one of the best proofs we have that these uh, constructs are are just based on, on ideas and society's uh, construction right um because if it wasn't the case the, if the, if the role of what we're talking about men but the role of women wouldn't have changed in the last 30 40 50 years including in the fitness era, era right um if, if you just want to take a magazine from the 1960s uh on ideal women bodies um versus today's well we see just such drastic evolutions in what we consider uh, desirable that i mean it, it, what else do you want as a proof that like these are social constructs right um one of the reasons in the fitness going back to your question of, of why we see women while well, going harder in the gym and stuff like that because guys mostly guys have decided in the last 15 years that we should teach women that being cardio bunnies and being uh doing hit makes them you know makes them being like a barbie makes them being like it's a proof of their stupidity lack of knowledge lack of of uh, of knowing the, the evidence right it's like well you know how many times have you seen this on instagram if you're doing uh, cardio as a girl to lose weight uh, you're just stupid because you don't understand that uh, you're not going to get the body and and you know let me teach you as a guy how, how it works um i mean I, <laughs> I had to unfollow someone this morning because it was i didn't realize it but um when i actually took the time to look at their page um it was a you know a fitness coach and it, they had a couple of good posts but it was extremely predatory towards women and it was a male uh, trainer and it was pretty clear that that's what they were doing. It was just really, really um, the lowest, you know, common denominator, the lowest hanging fruit ideas, not very challenging topics, kind of just like you said, it's kind of, kind of become a little bit um, cliche to say these things. And it, it was just something I couldn't, we couldn't follow them because it was incredibly predatory. But I think that's a little bit reflective, like you mentioned, um, the just disconnection, the lack of empathy, I think is a big part of it, though. Yeah. Yeah, and there's just like so many ways we can go through, through this, right? So looking at the, at the something I that we touch on also stream of the panel, right? Is is the, the sexual desirability of, of body images, right? So like we know for a fact that m most women prefer less muscular guys than what men prefer as the ideal amount of muscularity, if that makes sense, right? So ask a guy what he wants to, to look like, and he's going to pull you a picture of a, a, like a semi natty kind of almost juicy uh, <laughs> guy that's like eight percent body fat abs with huge biceps uh, and well built and then show this picture to most girls who are not in the fitness area and they'll be like oh you know uh, yeah, maybe not my, my kind of guy but you do you so you're no, that's interesting. Not... <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's interesting because i wonder how much um so i wonder how much of that besides the fact that you know that guy looking at the incredibly jacked eight percent um did not even considering the fact that his testosterone is probably in the tank and he can't sleep right and he's got mood issues and every all that good stuff you know uh just from being that lean probably for that long because that's something we do in the industry now but also i wonder how much of that is then the, the i try to as much as possible kind of look back from like a evolutionary perspective what would the um signals that that kind of physique would be portraying to somebody and then it gets kind of washed away and all messy because of, like you said, these things change over time. So it's almost like, if you've seen The Office when uh, Michael Scott says, I don't even consider my, myself to be a part of society. It seems like that's what kind of needs to happen. Like, it's just this, like, you're always trying to shoot at a moving target when in reality, if you find the values for you um, and what you believe is important, I think that's kind of a great place to kind of draw back to. I think that's a great point. And, and going back to the, the point of, of value-based coaching, Right. I think that, that makes a perfect bridge. What we were just talking about is, is why are you doing this and what are the values? And right. And the part of it is also related to the fact that, well, dieting is not very well perceived currently in society. So most guys or most people in general are going to be like, well, I'm doing this for my health. Um, well, two points, right? Like, first of all, you're not doing this for your health. And secondly, people are going to be like, well, I want to look great naked to, to you know, get women. You're not doing this for, for women, right? So you're not doing this for health and you're not doing this to, to pick up chicks and, and get laid. Uh, because like, guess what, right? First of, first of all, this is not super healthy. And secondly, like the amount of muscle mass you're going for is not needed to, to be popular or, or get laid as they might say. So you're doing this because you wanna look a certain way because you wanna impress other guys um, so like, this is a very interesting, you know, we can look at that from the both of those from multiple perspectives. And I think that you were kind of beating around the bush a little bit there. But on that first one, we can look at it from a short term, long term perspective. Like, are you doing it for your health, whatever weight loss, whatever it is like that. 
um, sep like short separating from the short term effects and the long term outcomes. That's an obvious thing. Just because you're losing weight right now doesn't mean you're going to maintain that long term. Now let's get to the other aspect of that. You said uh, lifting weight to impress other women. I've talked about this quite a bit with people, even as recently as a couple of days ago, because the women in the gym do not care if you have five more pounds on the bar than the guy next to you on the bench press. Nobody gives a shit. In fact, <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. I mean, we can go down to like a um, biomechanics perspective. Where is that force being channeled? Okay, you added 10 pounds, but that 10 pounds of force is not being you know, channeled to the pecs or you know, surrounding musculature in the way that you want it to. So again, a short term perspective, it doesn't matter. It may not matter at all, but it, it's funny that you brought that up because I have said time and time again, men do not lift to impress women. They lift to impress other men. They just don't realize it. And yep. I, th I think it's important, yeah, I think, because I think it's important um, to recognize that because at a certain point, you're going to have to lower the weight. I think that that's, I think, oh, man, that seems to be kind of the crux of the, not the entire issue, but kind of a metaphorical gateway for people to get away from, men to get away from this alpha male mindset, this go work harder, you know, no days off. I used to pride myself on working, being the hardest person I, on the Marine Corps gym. So it was a big ass gym, a lot of hard people. I thought that I needed to be working harder than anybody else in the gym. The moment that I stepped back and said, okay, you know, let's maybe periodize this a little bit. Let's make sure that, you know, the force is going to the right muscles. My form's good. My execution is proper. And then let's start making progress again. But that kind of metaphorical wall that we came up against that I see men come up against a lot. In fact, increasingly so women as well, but is the lowering the weight chilling the fuck out a little bit let's think about this longer term and things like that so um, i'm glad that you brought that up you beat around the bush a little bit but we it really does come down to we're not lifting to impress women we're lifting to impress other men in the gym yeah and this is going back to the issue we were discussing earlier regarding why do we do this long term and i think a huge part of it is just question of control right um and that's different in every different person but i i think when you're in a society or in a body or in a life that you feel like you're lacking control um well just finding ways to to impose control on what you can is, is a classic strategy mm. to, to feel like you're in the driving seat right so um a lot of guys will feel actually better when they're dieting and when they're, they're balking right yeah uh, because they feel like they're in control they, they, they they're in compliant they you know they're improving the physique and stuff like that um right or they're, they're increasing the weight like for me for me it's not doing great but they're increasing the weight weight to uh, weak tweak they're not making progress but like they have an impression of control uh, regarding the, the results uh, on their, their well-being and on, on their health they, they perceive like they're you know they have control over some point of their life yeah I, I agree and i think that uh it would be ridiculous and inappropriate for us to take that away from somebody because i look back and i know for a fact that though i was not actually creating progress there were times when I was coming in the gym and my life was shit at the time and, you know, adding a couple pounds to the bar, that was a win for me. And maybe that's what I needed for the day. And maybe that's what people need for the day. But again, at a certain point, it, it comes down to are the actions that you're taking congruent with the results that you want. And you mentioned the control thing. And I think that's another aspect of, um, to some degree, an aspect of ego. We want to present to the world that we're this put together, you know, we're accomplishing things, we're making progress, we have our shit figured out. But in reality, we are just kind of going through the process like everybody else and figuring things out as we go. But, you know, not wanting to have that, um, at least the perception that we don't know what we're doing, that we're doing. It's almost that we, we puff our chests up. We, you know, if we're the biggest one in the gym, people are going to think we know what we're doing. <laughs> that's really often not the case. Yeah, that's a good point. So it's just like, it, there's nothing wrong with doing a certain thing right ever. It's not, it's not about what you're doing. It's about, do you know what you're doing? And can you be honest with yourself with what you're doing? It, right. If you're like, you know what, I'm, I had a sh shitty day, had a shitty week, whatever, you know, one reason when you want, you want to vent or a new scenario, I just had a bad week. Sure. You know what, today, I don't feel like doing my program. I'm just going to have fun in the gym, slap some weights onto a bar, do some not great squats or some some bench and i'm just going to stop when i feel like it i'm not going to follow my program you know what if, if you're doing that without getting injured there's nothing wrong with that just mm -hmm. don't you know pretend like well you know what i'm improving so much because i you know, just just be being honest with yourself and <laughs> cognizant of what you're doing is a huge step forward with just being in in, in tune with uh, how yeah. you feel and I think that a unique aspect of the fitness space, um, especially currently with the widespread um, nature of social media and how we kind of go hand in hand, the fitness space and social media, 
um, is the fact that at what point do people that are influencing others have some sort, I want to get into like the personal responsibility aspect, like you had mentioned in our emails, but at what point do people that are actually impacting, influencing people's lives, at what point is it, um, I mean, we'll kind of stick with men, at, at what point is it, is it their responsibility to not, not, not betray is the wrong word, but mislead, mislead people as to exactly what got them there, what is going to help them get there and things like that. Um, because it's very unique that um, influencers really do have the ability to impact people on a very, very large scale. Um, what are your thoughts on that? It's, it's kind of hard to describe that. Yeah, I, I, well, if, the first thing is, is and I think that's, um, I think you've worked out, you, she used to be your coach, but like Gabriel Fanero, the, the way she, mm. she puts it is, is, well, first of all, like dieting is a medical intervention, right? It has some risks, um, and it's a sports contact, the way she puts it. And that's something she, she told, she told me years ago, and it's always, t- it's, you have to be honest with people that, well, changing something like the diet, changing the lifestyle is a medical intervention, and it's going to have pros and cons. Um, so regarding the responsibility, I think there's just nothing to say there. Um, I think we're way, way past the, the issue of responsibility on social media. Um, mm-hmm. and I think, right. There are some issues regarding honest, like if, if we can go down the road of people are, are using, um, some supplements that are not being truthful and, and that's damaging for, for your self image. Um, it can lead to disordered eating, eating disorders can lead to um, broken uh, body image. But I mean, it, it gets so much worse than that in other spheres of social media. Um, like it's some, so it, that's something I, I feel I've been more involved in the last couple of years is just more nutrition research online, right? Um, there, there's no way to look at the, the state of social media and not to be very skeptical, skeptical of, of before this is headed. We, we look at, at, at the way people discuss you know, cholesterol online, um, right? People recommending other people not to use their, their drugs that are recommended by their PCP. Uh, people get, getting off statins because, well, you know what? It's, it's, a, it's a lie by big pharma, stuff like that. It's, it's I mean, it's, it's borderline criminal. Um, it's providing medical advice by people who are, who are not um, or not qualified for this. Um, I mean, how, how many coaches have you seen uh, providing advice on on optimizing their hormones when, like, this is based on your research? I mean, you're not qualified to read the research you're linking. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. So <laughs> it, it, like, you may be you working in this field and it being very successful, but not many people are, are qualified to actually read and understand the research that they're talking about. Yeah, the endocrine system, I've taken more than a few classes that covered the endocrine system, and I still do not understand it to the point where I would even discuss it. Now, don't get me wrong, as a younger trainer, I mean, again, you, we're in this interesting information age where if you want to, you can learn enough to feel comfortable discussing something, but not enough to be competent. And it's that's, I think that's really where a lot of the danger comes because we leave, read these, these headlines and things like that. And, and then we, and then we, you know, try to relay that to people, but it, I, I really appreciate the ability to go back to, like you mentioned, Dr. Pandero and, and other experts that are really just trying to get information out there. Um, Iron Culture is one of my favorite podcasts, Stronger by Science, those kinds of things, um, because it's really just helpful. It's comforting. Um, comfort being might be the wrong word. It's uh, reassuring to have people that are objectively analyzing these things, because I think that's really, again, that, that's what irks me the most. And I'm looking back at my own behaviors as a young fitness enthusiast, and um, none of it was objective. It was haphazard and random. It was nonsense. And that's really what I think um, irks me the most is when I see fitness professionals following that same vein and leading people down that same vein, when you've decided to lead those people, you're in a position of influence and a position of not power per se, but oftentimes it is viewed as that, or it's even portrayed as that by the fitness professional. Um, I see this off more often with male trainers where it's this, I am the authority. And as we know, that's really one of the least effective ways to go about this, but um, it really just keeps coming back to um, I'm trying to perhaps reach uh, a younger version of myself and kind of get them to separate from this, this idea that um, really that anybody knows what they're doing it, uh, to the level that they think they do. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And, and I think you can make the argument that the, the, finding the balance between those two is, is where we still have to figure it out because if we look at a lot of the movement, movement that's that's the anti-diet movement, the um, 
pace movements. Um, I think they've brought a ton to the field, to, to the fitness field. Um, I mean, a lot of people in the fitness world are still not going to recognize that they're swinging and stuff that's very valuable, but um, there has to be also like a balance between like the, the very, very fitnessy people and very, very haste people. Um, and I, I don't think we, we found that balance yet, right? Um, mm-hmm. We know that losing weight is doable, not easy. Maintaining weight is very, very difficult. We know that the most efficacious interventions are, are the medical ones, right? So uh, going on drugs, um, going for bariatric surgery. Um, and then just, <laughs> if you're in a situation where um, your, your set point, whatever, your body, body weight is, is at a very, very high level, uh, it's unlikely that you'll be able to maintain a weight loss. Uh, but that's just not great for, for, for selling programs because that's not what people want because, because that's normal, right? <laughs> like every day you're being told that you're, you're a fat failure because you're in, you're, you're, you're in a large body. And then you go see someone to help you fix that issue. And they're like, well, actually I have nothing to sell you that's going to help. Yeah. Um, but I can help you improve your health. And you're like, well, that's not why I'm coming to you. So I think that's kind of the crisis that a lot of the fitness and coaches are, are facing right now. Yeah, I would completely agree that. So it's kind of a bi-directional issue because um, there are uh, coaches and trainers that are feeding into that. But then, like you said, when people come to you expecting something of that nature and over time, I think that you get more, it's almost an art form. I think you get more skilled at speaking to those people, whether it's, you know, a middle-aged man who just thinks that he needs to not be able to walk for the rest of his life because he has to squat and deadlift heavier every single session, or, you know, his shoulder's broken and he, he thinks that he needs the barbell bench heavy every session. Those kinds of things that we, we separate um, or we get separated from, again, what our actual values are, what our actual goals are um, because we're not really told, I guess, to we're, we kind of have just um, that what we're born into, the industry that we're born into. And I think that it's very hard for people to change and especially a, a, a fitness professional that's comfortable or, you know, somebody with a good career that's going, or they find that the content that really gets the reactions are the ones that are really kind of, you know, pushing these pain buttons in a, in a manipulative way. Yeah. And I think there's a great link to do with, with the, the issues of gender we were t- touching on earlier, right? Um, <laughs> Like in my experience, I don't know for you, but it's been a lot harder to, to try to talk guys into considering um, weight neutral approaches or seeking help from a PCP, um, right? The, the, a lot of guys are just, that, that just clashes with their, their identity as a guy. And that's just like, well, no, like, I, like I've seen it so, like, so many times that they're like, well, if I want to lose weight, like it's just about changing this thing and it'll work. That's why I'm coming to you. And you're like, well, it's a lot more complicated than that. And like, maybe you'll succeed, maybe you won't succeed. And their answer is like, no, no, you don't know me. Like, I'm, I'm a hard worker, man. Like, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to push myself. Like, you have no idea. So, so I'm going <laughs> to, I'm, I'm going to lose the weight because I'm going to push myself work so hard. And you're like, well, no, no, that's the opposite, right? Like, I, I don't want yourself, I don't want you to burn yourself out by trying so hard that you just crack and develop an eating disorder, right? That's, I'm telling you the opposite. Mm-hmm. And the message is, is, is right? It, it doesn't flow very well and we guys especially yeah i think that it's really not necessarily more of a function but it's probably more indicative of the fact that we are really hesitant to onboard new ideas and and our initial response is nearly always to reject it or to find holes in it and so this you know approach they say you know like uh, let's you know try it. We're not even necessarily saying weight neutral because i think that that has some connotations for especially men um like you said they're just gonna, not gonna but maybe say you know let's not focus on the scale for a little bit yeah you know, let's just see you know let's get you a little bit stronger build a little muscle um we may do measurements or something but they'll get back on the scale in a little bit um that is kind of difficult to um like you said to, to get people to buy into um but i mean this is I, these are just really I think deeply rooted, but I, I think that after this conversation, I'm a little bit more optimistic that there may be some things changing. What are some things that you, um, I think we touched on a bunch of stuff today, but I, I guess maybe to make it a little bit more concise, what is um, one way that you think that the fitness industry, the, the fitness and nutrition space can improve overall? Um, I think empathy is something you, you touched on earlier, which I think is, is at the root of it, right? Um, most guys who work in, in the fitness industry um, as coaches and trainers have never gone through what they're asking their clients to do. Uh, and it's impossible to understand. So I'm, I'm not asking coaches and, and trainers to, to understand because you can't, right? You can't, it, it's like these changes that are going to, to, to operate in, in your clients are, 
it's, it's like if you've never dealt with with drug addiction or something like that like you can't ask someone to understand what, what it is right you, you the people who work with with people who have addictions they, they don't understand what they're going through but they have empathy to try to help them in the best way possible and it's something very similar here right it's like listen you probably don't know what it is to be thinking about food 18 hours a day when you're awake and that most of your thoughts between meals are are focused on, on what you're going to eat, <laughs> how many calories you have left, stuff like that uh, for the rest of your life, just like that, right? So I'm exaggerating a bit depending on situation um, and how full-blown full, full blown of an eating disorder you have, but it's, it's stuff like this, right? So recognizing that you probably don't understand what's going on in, in your client's life and accepting that you're just here to provide tools and support them however possible, I, I think is the root of it. So empathy and then working with the values of the, of the client are the, are the first part of it. And then just looking at the, the influences behind, behind what's going on to, to put it all together. Yeah, I think empathy is really a, a door that unlocks a lot of um, further resources um, because you're not going to be able to, um, even as far as considering what that person's life schedule is like from just the logistics perspective, not even like a are they going to have the motivation? Not even, I hate, damn it, I shouldn't have said motivation. Are they going to have the ability to go to the gym after working a 12 hour shift? And like uh, younger, not even younger, but a less empathetic fitness professional is going to say, it doesn't matter, I would, or you know, never mind the fact that they're at a gym for you know, 10, 12 hours a day, regardless. But I mean, the most, the most apparent and most glaring um, example of this, I think, is, is that whole, um, you know, uh, uh, a trainer telling a single mom that everybody has the same 24 hours like that's the most ridiculous uh, obvious aspect of that but it happens on such a scale if you do not have the ability to empathize with others to empathize with the people that you're working with and i don't know if that is um perhaps because the industry is just from the get-go a very externally motivated externally focused um space um, so it's kind of bringing in trainers and coaches and just professionals that aren't necessarily um, more empathetic. I think perhaps, you know, people that are painfully empathetic end up going into nursing or becoming doctors mm -hmm. or caregivers of another kind. So maybe, like you said, I, I, I'm not surprised that um, I was very happy that you said that, that empathy would be one of the biggest things that you would change because I completely agree with that. Yeah, and I think the, the best way to, to look at it is is we don't have tons of evidence on, on what works in, in our specific niche, right? So looking at other fields is very instructive at times. So if, if one example I like to give is, is people usually talk about cancer as, as, as a scientific research question. Um, that's uniform, right? But um, it's very interesting to look at, for example, within the cancers, um, lung cancer tends to be seen differently, right? You can ask anyone if they have cancer, you'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, wait, you have lung cancer? You were, you're a smoker, right? Or something like that. And then narrative changes all of a sudden. And it's very similar to what we see here, right? But kind of the opposite. So, well, if you're fat, if you're obese, well, it's your responsibility. Unless, well, maybe you have a rare uh, <laughs> genetic disorder that makes it not your fault. But if not, it's your fault and your, your responsibility. Uh, and then you have to, you know, pick yourself up at bootstraps and just have the motiv motivation and discipline to turn your life around, to, to, to change that and you owe it to society and to yourself and to other people. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> so I'm on a little bit of a mission myself personally to not be, uh, this has been a process over a long period of time, but I think a good uh, guiding light for me personally is to not be a negative in anybody's life. And so I want to uh, potentially do a podcast with you in the future about how we can discuss and work with people that are you know, living with obesity without fucking them up more. Like, because a lot of the things that we do as fitness professionals are at the very least insensitive, but it certainly is, in, uh, you know, on, it, it wouldn't be, and we wouldn't be saying it, we wouldn't be doing it if we had really considered, like you said, the experiences of people that are, have gone through this process are living in this, um, like this. So it's, it's something that I think we're gonna need to talk about a lot more in a future episode for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and going back to the empathy, right? It's impossible to understand what you just yeah. said if, if you don't have the capacity for empathy. You can't understand that while just saying something to a client might, you know, actually impair the health in a negative way um, because you're trying to help that person. Uh, and if you, you can't put that, put yourself in your shoes or in your mindset, then it's impossible to have that uh, that effort and that conversation with yourself. So, so yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, I think we need to really realize as fitness and you know, nutrition professionals, the ability to impact people, even if it's just a simple interaction. I've had people come up to me that I spoke to three or four years prior to that um, and just a short conversation and they completely changed their training approach. And, you know, they wanted to tell me about it when they saw me three, four years later. So it's not um, unheard of that we're going to have large impacts. I think that, like you said, having empathy and and taking a step back and realizing that we can impact people is, I think, a great first step to really going in the right direction for really the entire industry, I would say. Absolutely. All right, Gabriel, man, it was good talking with you today. Um, I think we may hurt some people's feelings, but it's all right. I think that it's definitely needed. Um, but I think you did a fantastic job of really kind of starting to paint this issue. Like I said, we it doesn't get talked about enough, so it's almost hard to understand where to start and where to you know, keep poking holes, but I think if we have following episodes, we'll start getting it nailed down for sure. Yeah, it'll be a pleasure. Thank you so much.